We're going to look at some more integration today, more different um, different ways to integrate. Uh, some of it I think you're familiar with. I think you're a little bit familiar with partial fractions. Improper integrals will be brand new today, okay? Um, I believe. And it's a little complicated. So um, that's why we want the AB book open because I like the way they have it set up and explain it there. Um, partial fractions... Um, I'm just gonna go through that with you. All right. Again, it's another integration technique. We're, we're building this toolbox of different techniques to do integration depending on the problem that we're given. And so it's just a matter of trying to figure out what's the best way to go. And so this first from your workbook on page 149 is example two. And maybe initially you look at this and go, eh, that doesn't seem too bad. Right? Um, and hopefully you've gotten to a place where you understand that I need to check for something because if it's not a just straight <coughs> integration, your first uh, <coughs> tool that you should be trying is use substitution, right? And so whenever we get to these kinds of problems, you want to check for the possibility of use substitution first because if you can do that, there's a likelihood that this problem is just not going to be that challenging, okay? So the question is, will use substitution work here? If so, why? If not, why not? And what would you substitute, what, what would you potentially substitute um, for you? <coughs> yes, I would like you to answer that question, yes. What would so if you were going to see which one would be which would be you? What would you what would you choose to be you? The denominator, right? The x squared minus two x minus three. What is the derivative of that? Because if the derivative of that is this or part of this, then we can use u substitution. So what's the derivative of this going to be? Two x minus two. Is there a way to manipulate this to use two x minus two? Do you think? I don't, it isn't. Um, if this was just an x up here, or it was a 2x, or maybe a 4x, possibly. But in this case, u substitution is not going to work. So um, we've talked about division before, and we, we typically use division when either uh, the, uh, the degrees are the same, or the degree on top is bigger. If the degree on the bottom is bigger, um, Division is really not going to work. It's not going to get us anywhere because this is like the remainder to a division problem where the um, dividend is uh, x squared. So obviously we're talking about partial fractions. So what we need to do is see if this is factorable. Now I know in some of the problems that we've been doing, factoring is not your go-to, but we still have to be good at that. And when you see a, a trinomial, a quadratic, expression, if it can be factored, you should try and factor it. So factor this bottom, it is factorable. What, it, what is it? Yep, x minus 3 times x plus 1. Now, here's where um, we can use partial fractions because essentially what we're going to do is it's, it's, uh, we're going to decompose this fraction into two separate fractions and you can decompose it into as many factors in the denominator as there are so if for, for example there were three factors we could have three fractions and of course if we can in if we can get it down to just one fraction that's a little less complicated then it's easier to integrate now how we do that is what what we've got to remember is that What we've got to remember is that when we, when we combined fractions before adding and subtracting fractions, it was a matter of getting a common denominator and figuring out how to get an equivalent fraction so that we have the ability to combine. When we do that backwards, what, which is what we're going to do, we're going to separate and have two fractions one with the denominator of x minus 3, one with the denominator of x plus 1. And 
those fractions added together will equal this. And that's, here's what that is going to look like. Okay. So we're going to, again, essentially break the bottom up. And we're going to create two new fractions. These two new fractions will equal, the, the sum of them will equal what we have here. What this allows us to do is to integrate each of these fractions individually. And typically, that makes integration go easier for us. Now, the trick is figuring out what A is and what B is. And if there was a third one, we'd have a C, okay? So what we have to remember when adding fractions, we need a common denominator. Well, this is both of these factors. So for those of you who had me for algebra two, I used to talk about, okay, if in order to get a common denominator, I need to multiply this by the missing factor. Well, what factor is missing from x minus three that the common that the overall denominator has? It's missing the x plus one. So I have to multiply top and bottom by x plus one. What's missing from over here? X minus three. So I'm gonna multiply top and bottom by x minus three. And what we're gonna do is create an equivalent expression equation so that we can solve for a and b. Okay, and so here's what that looks like. Um, of course, I could have all of this, right? This would be over x minus 3, x plus 1, over x minus 3, x plus 1, over x minus 3. I could have that. But in reality, you don't need it because once we have gotten a common denominator, which is what we're doing, we're getting a common denominator, since the denominators end up all being the same, that means the numerators all end up being the same too. So that's why we don't need any of this. Okay, if you really want to write it, you can, but we don't need it. Okay. <coughs> now, from here, what we're going to do, first of all, have you guys done this before? Have you done this decomposition of fractions and partial fractions before? Maybe it's fuzzy. Okay, okay, good. Um, so then it's just a matter of distributing, distributing, setting the x terms equal to each other and the constant terms equal to each other. You end up with a system of equations where you have to solve for a and b. And um, then you integrate each of those fractions. You're going to integrate whatever this constant is over uh, x minus 3 dx. And then you're going to integrate this, whatever this is. Okay, so when we just definite integral. Oops. Okay, I get ax plus a, bx minus 3b still equals 5x minus 3. Now, here's where um, we finally get some sort of breakthrough, all right? All these x terms have to be equal to each other, and all the constant terms have to be equal to each other. And what's interesting is just recently in... Um, Algebra 2, we we're looking at imaginary numbers, and we had some situations that are very similar to this. And so it's a matter of creating these two new equations from that, and I have a system of equations that looks like this. Okay. And then it's just a matter of solving that system. Now, for those of you wondering about the x's, do you need them? I mean, you, no, you don't. If ax plus bx equals 5x, that means a plus b equals 5, All right? Because you could, if you wanted to think about it this way, you could factor out an x so therefore that a plus b equals 5, okay? So solve that system, see what you get for a and b, and then we'll talk about how to integrate it after that. Really the system that I'm solving here is a plus b equals five. So this is the system that I'm solving. And that just comes from there. Yeah, 
so on the next screen, I you don't you won't see this. I went right from here to trying to um, combine this equation with this one. So I multiplied this top one by three instead of negative one. I don't know why I did that, but I did that. Um, so I multiplied this by three. I got three a plus three b equals fifteen. Then I can just combine these again. There's obviously multiple paths to this. Uh, a equals three. And so uh, B has to equal two. Okay. Again, if you got, you probably got it a different way, which now that I look at it makes more sense to me than the, what I did. So, but it doesn't matter. You get the same answers. All right, we good on those? All right, so what that allows us to do now is if we substitute the three back in and the two back in, we can integrate this fraction, we can integrate this fraction. And since the tops are constants, it makes it really pretty easy. Okay, um, so here is where I'm at now. So I'm integrating this with A being 3 now, integrating this with B <coughs> being 2, and um, they're pretty straightforward, so you can finish that one. I would just think of this 3 out in front, and so that you're integrating 1 over x minus 3, so that's just the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 3, and this is the natural log of the absolute value of x plus 1 with the 2 in front. And then, of course, you have your c. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Now, here's the thing. <laughs> Just a little review of our log properties. If this was a multiple choice question, that might be one of the answers. Okay. But they may also rewrite it using log properties. Okay. So if you recall what log properties... When I have a number out in front, <coughs> what can I do? Make it an exponent. Make it an exponent on what? The x minus 3 is absolute Yeah, value. on this. And what about this 2? Same thing. Same thing, but with the x. Plus 1. But then, with this plus. Really write it. How did I do that? Oh, no. All right, I messed up. This is definitely wrong. Time out, please. When would it be division? If it was minus. Ugh. Can't believe I messed that up. I'm sorry. Human beings, we make mistakes, right? All right, let's fix it. So this would be the absolute value of x minus 3 cubed. Do I need the absolute value for the x minus 1? Or x plus 1? Why not? Because when you square it, what does that mean? Positive. So... You could leave it, though. It's fine. All right. <coughs> That's better. And, it, and maybe it would even look like this. So, so, again, I don't know how likely it is to be a multiple choice question that the answer would be in this form. But it's, I think when they do things like that, it's like, all right, let's test you on some pre-calc and see if you know your log properties so it could happen okay all right questions on that we're going to go over another example here yeah oh sorry can you explain the part where you do the systems and equations in? this yeah so you i canceled off the x's basically and then i multiplied by three because i decided i was going to cancel the b's out okay. instead of just going make this one negative which would have been way That's easier. Fair. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I did it different. And I look at it now and go, why did I do that? And I don't have an answer. <laughs> Whenever I was making this, that, that seemed like the most logical thing. When I could have just changed the signs of this and wrote negative A minus B minus 5, you know, and then solve for B. A again, you, you get the same thing. Different paths. All right, let's look at another one. Um, I used the same denominator they use the same denominator, okay? So we don't have to do so much factoring. All right, again, what should you check for first? <coughs> what is the derivative of the bottom? Mm, yeah, see, there you go. So if you, if you check that, then maybe, okay, we're gonna get lucky every once in a while. Okay, sometimes we get in this pattern of like, okay, we're doing partial fractions now, so all the problems will be partial fractions. Well, 
you got to think through it a little bit. And since we get a 2x minus 2 out of it, u substitution works really easy here. Um, so go ahead and finish it. Um, of course, with the u substitution, okay, u is going to be this, du is going to be that. It's pretty straightforward from there. Natural log <laughs> of the absolute value of u, and then we just sub again, and we're good to go. Okay. Sometimes that's going to happen. Um, so just look out for that. I want you to check for this first because uh, even though oftentimes integration can get, can get kind of complicated, it doesn't always get complicated. So just look out for that. All right. Get your get that AB book ready. Um, today we're going to talk about improper integrals. Today will be new. There's going to be a lot of new concepts um, built by concepts you already know. Okay, we're just going to take them and put them together and um, do our best to understand why we have something that's called an improper integral, how to integrate it, and what kind of techniques to use. We're going to go through, uh, I want to say, I think I have three different examples that we're going to go through. Today. So first off, this is in your book. Okay, There are two different ways when we consider an integral improper. The first one is really straightforward. You're going to see one or both of the limits of integration are going to be infinite, positive infinity or negative infinity. If we're integrating and either the lower limit is negative infinity or the upper limit is infinity or it is from negative infinity to infinity, that is considered an improper integral. The other case where this happens is when we have a discontinuity a vertical asymptote, right? Where there's some value for x that forces the denominator to equal zero. That is the other situation where we have uh, an improper integral. And it'll be harder to tell. This one will be easy to tell. You'll see an infinity on the integration symbol, okay? This one you're gonna have to analyze a little bit and go, oh, there's a denominator. There's an x in the denominator. It can be zero when this happens, okay? So those are the two situations that you have to look out for. Again, this one will be obvious because you'll see the infinity symbol or negative infinity symbol. This one not as obvious, okay? Now, that's the condition. When these conditions exist, we have to approach integration very differently than anything you've done before, okay? And so on page uh, five, Eight in your AB book. Now, I, I have broken it down uh, in, in parts. So if you go to 528, you'll see the entire thing, which is fine. You can screenshot that and put that in. I would not try to write all this stuff down. I would screenshot and put it in your notes because as I try to go through and explain it, it's important that you can kind of keep up because it's tricky. There's really three types of improper integrals, okay? Um, this one where infinity is the upper limit. The other one would be negative infinity is the lower limit. And then the third type is when um, you have a vertical asymptote. Okay. I guess you could technically say four types when if this was negative infinity and positive infinity. Notice here what happens. And we use this uh, variable t. I've seen other variables used that other than t. So if when you're working on it, you see a different variable, it means the same idea, okay? The upper limit t is the, when, when um, the upper limit for the integral is infinity, okay? Obviously, this number has to be bigger than this number. Anytime we set up, well, I guess it's not always that way, but um, in, in the case where one of the limits is infinity, it'll be the top limit. The, the bottom limit will be smaller, and that's all that this is saying, okay? Uh, in order to integrate this, we are looking at a limit as t approaches infinity from a to t of f of x, okay? So we've shifted away from using infinity in the integration symbol and moved it to our limit. And then that's where the t replaces the infinity because this value t is approaching infinity it's closer 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 to unbounded all right 
So if this limit exists, then that equals the integral of this. Simple enough-ish, okay? You're like, okay, but what does that mean? What do I do with it? All right, let's look at it. Okay, here's the, this is type one, number two, where now notice instead of the, uh, the, lo the lower limit is negative infinity. So similar, okay, and now B is our upper limit, and then negative infinity down here. T, of course, is less than this. Similar kinds of things, okay? Instead of approaching positive infinity at the upper limit, we approach negative infinity on the lower limit of the integral, okay? Again, if this limit exists, then we say, in either case, if the limit exists, we call it convergent. It converges to a specific number. In reality, when you were doing limits back in the day, when you were first learning about limits, you could have said it converged to that number as well. Okay. Similarly, if it doesn't have a limit, we say that it diverges. Okay. And that's another way of saying the limit does not exist. So if the limit exists, it converges to whatever the number is. If it does not exist, it diverges. Uh, just as a preview one of the things that we're going to be doing in chapter nine in the third quarter fourth quarter i think it's fourth quarter actually now is we're going to spend a lot of time trying to decide if particular polynomials functions converge or diverge and there is a series of tests in order to do that just a little preview it's a lot okay but this concept of convergence and divergence is going to recur for the rest of the year. Okay. All right, the rest, okay? The last situation, again, these are all, they're calling them all type one, is if both um, limits are infinity, negative infinity, okay? In this case, <laughs> notice what they do here. They split it up, okay? You can use any real number A. So we're gonna evaluate two different limits. One where negative infinity approaches some real number A. And so we'll essentially do it this way. So you're going to take a limit of this. And then from that same A, we're going to approach positive infinity. So then we're up in this case. So you're going to take, so you're going to have two limits that you're going to have to find for a problem like that. Okay. So this is all type one. Right, where where one of so yeah, it's three three types, type one, two, three. I would I don't know whatever, um, three different versions where one or both of the uh, integration limits are infinity or negative infinity. <coughs> so that's the first situation. Um, the next one is going to be when we have a vertical asymptote. This is on page 531. So if you want to, okay. That discontinuity in a situation like this is kind of what A is. We're kind of, we're gonna approach from the left to get to A, we're gonna approach from the right to get toward A, and then we're gonna see what each of those limits are. Yeah, they said it was equal. So if the book says it's equal, I say go for it if you want to. Over to 531. This is type two. I don't know what the number two was in there. But this is type two. It doesn't have to be. Yeah, because type two is like. Type two above it, and it's just, it's like something really short. Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, page 531 is where this is. Okay. And this is uh, tricky because you won't see it right away because the limits of, the integ of integration will be numbers, no infinity in here. But what's going to happen is there's some discontinuity, all right? So it, it might be B, it's whatever number it is, okay? That ends up being your top limit, okay? And so what we do is we say um, we're going to approach B from the left, 
from whatever our lower limit is, and we're gonna take the limit of that. And then um, we're gonna go the other way, okay? If our discontinuity is A, then we're gonna approach A from the right, okay? And then we'll try to see if it's divergent or convergent. So that, that discontinuity becomes that. So for, let me, I'm gonna go over here for a quick sec. That's what kind of happens over here. And we're gonna go through examples of all this. Um, but that discontinuity is the, is the pivot point, right? It's the place where I decide, all right, I gotta approach from the left, on, uh, left of that value, and then I've gotta approach from the right of that value and see whether or not that function converges or does. And general rule, don't write equal signs down. I don't want you to lose points for no reason. So we're back to verges, okay? Um, and so the same thing here, okay? There, there's a lot of, it's convergent if the limit exists on each side and divergent if it doesn't. So this is that discontinuity from A to B. So what we can do essentially is go from A to C where the discontinuity is and we take the left limit of this and then from um, C to B, because C is going to be in between A and B, and we approach from the right, and that's where we're going to find the limit of each of these, okay, because that's what's going on up here. All right, let's look at some examples. I think I did it. I think I did three examples, one of each. Let me double check that. One, two. Yes, we're going to do three. We're going to do one of each so that you can kind of get a sense of how this works. Any questions before we do that? <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so for this type, we're just going to take the limit of the function and just... There's some discontinuity in between A and B. Okay. Yep. And so that discontinuity is where the integrations split into two. We integrate to the left of the discontinuity we integrate to the right of the discontinuity, and we use this similar notation to find the limits of those because essentially what we're treating the discontinuity as, we're treating it as negative infinity or positive infinity. It's obviously not, but we're gonna approach it as if it was. Okay. Same sort of concept that way. All right, let's look at this first one. This is in your workbook. This is number nine, and I just put this here for reference. Okay, and I use this one because this one has positive infinity. This is not part of the problem. I just, since I changed slides, I wanted to use it as a reference. I'm starting to wonder about the phrasing improper integral. And as we're going through this, it's kind of a mix of a definite integral and an infinite integral, right? Like when we think of an infinite, or, or yeah, an infinite integral, we don't put bounds on it. And this is kind of a half and half. It's got a, it's got a number, and then it's got no bound. So maybe that's why they call it improper, because it's a mix of both. I don't know. I'm speculating. I have no idea if that's the reason, but it's got me thinking. All right. So we certainly have an improper integral here because we have uh, infinity as one of the bounds. And so what our first move is is to rewrite it as a limit. Okay, and so this is my skeleton that I'm going to use. And so T is going to approach infinity. So T becomes, goes here instead of infinity. And then F of X, of course, is just 1 over X squared. And I, I right away went ahead and changed this to uh, X to the negative 2 because I know that I'm going to integrate. Okay, and we're going to integrate as if it was a definite integral. And that's what the point is. We're going to treat T like it is some number, some real number, and then we're going to integrate it like it's a back over here. Okay, so that's our our really our next move is we're going to integrate this. We're going to think about this as a definite integral, and we're going to think of t as some real number. Okay, so go ahead and integrate x to negative two, and set it up. Don't don't simplify it yet. Let's do that one piece at a time. And I guess something else to notice here, it's helpful when, the, when you can see it, right? Because as we know, this can never equal zero, right? If 
I put zero in for X, or is, is, is X gets big, 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 it might as well be zero, but it can't, it approaches zero, but it never actually equals zero. Meaning this curve can never close. As far out as you go, and I know your calculator will, you know, has, has its own limitations, but this, this curve will never actually touch the x-axis. In order for that to happen, this would have to equal zero, which it can't. So that's another reason why we're thinking about it. And we're talking about an abstract concept here, all right? There will always be some space between this curve and the x-axis. Now, it, it's probably microscopic if you go out far enough. But it technically never equals zero, okay? And so that's another way to kind of think about this. We're trying to find the area under this curve as if it ends. But the truth is, it goes on and on forever. But there becomes a point where we're adding such small amounts of area to the area that it's inconsequential. And that's what's interesting about convergence versus divergence. Anyway, just an aside. All right, so you integrate this, hopefully that's what you got. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to essentially create a polynomial, and then we'll take the limit as t approaches infinity of that polynomial, okay? So it looks like, right. and I went ahead and changed it to a fraction because I think seeing the fraction that way helps us find the limit better, all right? So, so this is negative, all right, one over t minus negative one because one to the negative one is just one. So this is where I get my negative one over t plus one. And we're gonna evaluate the limit of this. Questions? Okay. So when I do that, what is this approach? Zero. zero. This ends up being zero. So long story short, it all equals zero. yes, all of this <laughs> equals one. Now, I want you to think about this again because it is abstract and I want you to try to rationalize this in your brain somehow. You know, I've been talking about this idea that this curve never touches the x-axis. As, as close as it gets, it never touches it. And so what happens is we get really far out here. The microscopic amounts that are being added to this area are so small that it's essentially inconsequential. And that's how we can say this area converges to one. Okay? And that concept is challenging because you're like, wait a minute, if I keep adding to the area, how could it ever stop growing? And what you have to understand is that as these numbers get increasingly big, this number gets increasingly small. And so you are essentially adding nothing to that one, which is why when we talk about the limit of this, we can call it zero, okay? And Maybe you never had an issue with that until now, and I'm making it too abstract for you. But when you learned about limits, you learned about things that way. All right, let's look at another one. Everything the same, except this would be negative infinity, the B would be up here, and the T would be there. Everything else is essentially the same. The old trigonometry. Now, if, if, this was negative infinity down here, you'd essentially, okay. So when we, when we rewrite it, again, obviously improper because we have the infinity symbol as an integration line. All right, no, we're right. Okay, so right away, I just rewrite it as a limit. Yeah. Oh, from here to here, if you wanted to go this way? Yeah. Yes. I wouldn't. Uh, hopefully by now, you the message has been 
Don't put equal signs if you're not sure. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's the message. Don't put an equal sign if you're not sure. And I would say, yes, those are equal. But I also don't, I've never graded an AP exam, and I don't know how those people think. Those people. <laughs> one day, maybe I'll be one of those people, but not yet. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. To me, these, these things are equal. Let's see what the, what did the books say. Did they say they were equal? Or did they write it just down below? Where did it go? Let's... Okay. So, straightforward enough. Integrate this like normal. Treat T like it's a number. Okay. What is the, what's the integral of cosine of X? Well, sine of x from t to zero. You can finish that. Mar, you have going over there? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, essentially, I'm taking the limit of the sine of t minus zero, because sine of zero is zero. All right. What's going on here? What's happening? What happens with the sine as uh, we get bigger and bigger and bigger? What's going on with the sine? fluctuates there's the word I was looking for oscillates right it oscillates between what zero. negative one zero one it goes in between negative one and one it just keeps bouncing back and forth right so we can't we can't we can't really find the limit of this okay so what we say for an improper integral, yes, the limit doesn't exist here, but for an improper integral, what we say is that this diverges. Okay, it diverges, meaning it never approaches a specific value. Converges means it sort of funnels down to a number or up to a number. Diverges means there's no limit. It's, it's, it never approaches a specific value, okay? Yes. I hesitate when to say every because I'm sure somebody can come up with some counterexample one time, and if one time it doesn't work, you know, I'm thinking about powers and that kind of thing. Again, chapter nine. We'll get to it. Don't worry. Don't worry. We're getting there. All right. Last example I want to look at. I think it's the last example. Yeah, this is the last example I want to look at. Okay. So this one is not as obvious that it's an improper <coughs> integral, okay? So I have regular limits. Negative one to two. And so the question to you is, is this an improper integral and why if it is? I already told you that it was, so I gave it away, sorry. Why is it an improper integral? X cannot equal zero. We have, we have a discontinuity there, okay? There's a vertical asymptote, X equals zero, which means X cannot equal zero. That would put us in an undefined situation. So that ends up being that C that I showed you on the other page. That's sort of that pivot point. So at zero, we're looking to the left of it, and at zero, we're looking to the right of it, and we're going to have two <coughs> limits that we're going to try to evaluate. And so when we set this up, the setup looks and I highlighted the zero as that pivot point, so to speak. So from negative one to zero is one integral, and then from zero to two is the other. And again, I already rewrote this as x to the negative three. So we can potentially integrate it. And from here, what I wanna do is change it to limit notation. And since I'm approaching zero from the left, I'm gonna have the zero with a little negative on top of it. And then here I'm approaching um, two or approaching zero from the right, you're going to have that plus sign, right? So it's going to look like that. And you can use t's, but there's no infinity. We use t when there's an infinity. Normally we think of our limits as a and b, okay? So that's why b is our top limit. And so I said b approaches zero from the left. And over here, a is my bottom limit. So this approaches zero from the right. So now it's just a matter of evaluating these integrals and then finding those limits. So go ahead and you can do that, go. All right, 
So our integration is pretty short. Okay. Um, x to the negative 2 over negative 2, or you could put negative 1 half, however you want to do that. <coughs> okay. Both of these are always going to be the same because the function is not going to change. So you really are only integrating once, all right, and then using that again. Your limits of integration are going to change. So from here, it's still pretty straightforward, right? You're still just substituting b in, substituting negative 1 in, substitu substituting 2 in, substituting a in, doing all the subtraction. Now, um, this is where you should have gotten to. If you didn't make this an 8 and left it as powers, that's fine, okay? But essentially what happens is this goes down, x squared, but I plug b in, and then the 1 goes in, um, and so this would be negative one half, but since we subtract, it changes to plus. Same thing over here. This goes down, so the two to the second is four, and that's why negative two times four is negative one eighth. This goes down, it just becomes a squared, and again, since it's subtraction, this changes to plus. Hopefully you got here. How many of you got here? Okay. Questions about that? And I skipped some steps in here, obviously. Um, now, here's where it gets tricky. Okay, It's not just plug a zero in. Right? It's not just plug a zero in here. It's, all right, what is happening as I'm approaching zero from the left? I'm getting infinitely smaller and smaller and smaller numbers, and I'm squaring those. So when I have these super small numbers and I square them, do I get a bigger number or a smaller number? So, so this value just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So you might be thinking, well, does this mean this goes to zero? If this is getting smaller and smaller and smaller on the bottom, what's happening to the top, so to speak? It's getting bigger. So if this grows smaller without bounds, you can think about it as going, okay, it's a fraction, a really small fraction, one over... 700 million but if that's it on the bottom one over one over 700 million or whatever big number you want to think of as the denominator it flips right because it's one divided by one over a really giant number in the denominator so keep change flip says take that giant number in the denominator and flip it up to the top so in reality as this number goes smaller and smaller and smaller, because it's in the bottom, it forces this fraction to grow bigger and bigger and bigger, which means this limit grows without bounds positively, okay? Or negatively in this case, because it's minus, right? So, so there is no limit here. We, we would say it was approaching negative infinity. Well, if you take negative infinity and you add a half to it, that nothing happens. It's still negative infinity. So this does not have a limit. This limit does not exist. And then we could say the same thing over here, the difference being now as I approach zero from the right, the values are positive. It wouldn't matter because we're squaring it anyway and there's not a negative here. And so the same thing is gonna happen over here. Story short, because those two things have no limit. Okay, this particular improper integral does diverge. Again, think about it this way. Um, I have one over this super um, small number. And, and, and with a calculator, you're doing things like this, right? If you're playing around with it, you're going to have a negative because it's negative. It's going to point zero like this. Mm -hmm. However many zeros you want to put, right? Well, that number as a fraction is one over, I'm going to put the negative up here so we can stop thinking about it, is one over, you know, however many zeros you want to put, right? And then you keep change flip that, and then this number essentially becomes this number. So this number gets gigantically negative because of this negative. This number gets gigantically positive. So I basically have negative infinity and a positive infinity. Now, no, that doesn't equal zero. You can't, you can't do that. Please don't ever do that. All right. Um, and so that's why it diverges.